All right, good morning, New Covenant family, Facebook family. Thank you all for tuning in to our live stream service on this morning, uh, this fifth Sunday in the month of August. And it is hot right now, and it's going to be hot the rest of the day. So I hope that y'all uh, do what you need to do to stay cool. However, this is the day that the Lord has made. We shall rejoice and be glad in it. Amen, Pastor Cheryl? Amen. Glory to God. I'm going to open up with our Psalm number 91 that we read each week. And uh, Pastor Cheryl is going to come back and she's going to share some things with us. Uh, she's going to uh, exhort you all and then she's going to, uh, after she exhorts, then she's going to uh, pray. All right. Amen. I'm just trying to get everything set up here, y'all. All right. So, Psalms number 91. Now, let me, before I read it, before I get into it, uh, I just want to say that uh, Brother DeAndre has music prepared. Man, it's good stuff again, as he always does. And we'll put that on Facebook after we finish up our service. I uh, want to remind you all to tune in to our Sunday school at uh, 1030. As soon as we finish up here, we're going to get into our Sunday school classes. We have Sunday school classes for uh, our, our adults. We are going through Total Money Makeover with Dave Ramsey. And we also have Sunday school for our youth and children as well. So uh, Sister Deidre and Sister Angelina, they sent out the information to the parents each week so the children can get connected uh, for the Sunday school hour. Uh, she should also have sent out the information for the adults to get connected for the uh, total money makeover class. All right. Now, Psalms number 91. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress. My God, in him I will trust. Surely he shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. He shall cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. And you shall not be afraid of the terror by night nor the arrows that fly by day, nor of the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor of the destruction that lay waste at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side and 10,000 at your right hand, but it will not come near you. Only with your eyes shall you look and see the reward of the wicked, because you have made the Lord, who is my refuge, even the most high your dwelling place. No evil shall befall you nor shall any plague come near your dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. They will bear you up in their hands lest you dash your foot against a stone. You shall tread upon the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the serpent you shall trample underfoot. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him on high because he has known my name, he shall call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. All right, Pastor Sheriff. Well, good morning, New Covenant. It's good to be with you all this morning. It is such a beautiful, hot, hot morning. Um, this week, I'm going to tell y'all something. My studies took me into the first book of Samuel. Amen. And mm -hmm. I was, um, oh, that, you know, when you, I've studied, you know, Samuel, the book of Samuel, you know, in, in passing, you know, I've read it. And, and every time, you know, you go to look at the Word of God. It's like God gives you fresh eyes and a fresh revelation. You come back, and He shows you something different. And I was, and you know, this week it was, it, it was so relatory of to what was going on in our country. You mm -hmm. know, with 
with uh, Jerry Falwell Jr. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> so, you know, I got to the, to the uh, second and third chapter of Samuel. You know, Samuel starts out, the first uh, book of Samuel starts out talking about Hannah, mm -hmm. Penina, and mm -hmm. Elkanah. Mm -hmm. And uh, then, you know, it, you know, because Hannah couldn't have children and Penina had children and, mm -hmm. you know, but Hannah went to God about it. Yeah. And, but Penina let her never forget that she was barren. Yes. And, you know, in our society today, if a woman doesn't have children, you know, she's looked upon as blessed. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but back then, mm -hmm. you know, it was the it was the opposite. It yeah. was a shame. You know, it, mm -hmm. it was like a woman was cursed. Yes. And so, but you all know that Hannah bore Samuel, and she promised God that she would give Samuel back to him to mm -hmm. serve him all the days of his life, and yes. he did. Yes, he did. He served in the house of the Lord. Mm -hmm. You know, after she had weaned him. Mm -hmm. And Eli raised him, and God began to, you know, it was it's amazing how his purpose was set in stone. Yes. <clears throat> and God began to speak to him even as a child. Yes. And he and he spoke to Samuel, and mm -hmm. you know because he told him, "I'm gonna kill Hophni and Phineas mm -hmm. because they have brought shame upon me, upon mm -hmm. my house." Yes. And Hophni and Phineas, they were very cruel men. They yes. were of the of of the Levites, mm -hmm. in you know, and they were they you know they worked in the house of the Lord, and they mm -hmm. took they took the best part of the offerings yes. from God. Yes, and they were sleeping with women, and mm -hmm. they were adulterous and. Mm -hmm. And fornicators, they just did whatever they wanted yeah. to yeah. in the house of the Lord. Yeah. And y'all know that these things shouldn't be. Yeah. And I, and and you know, as I was looking at the news this week, and that story broke, I, I was just sad for the house of God because yeah. when something like that happens, yes. people already point the Absolutely. finger at the church, Absolutely. and they say we're no good anyway. Absolutely. And you know, and this. Jerry Falwell Jr., his father started the Moral Majority, mm -hmm. and they were, that's a, a Christian pack group, yeah. a political pack group, right. and they have all these Christian rules and Christian values, mm -hmm. and come to find out... Family values, Paul. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, family values. Come mm -hmm. to find out that he, he was living any of those things. Mm -hmm. And so it really, really saddened me that, that what he and his wife have done, it is... Once again, it sets the church back because, yeah. you know, people here, here they go again, pointing their finger. See, that's why I don't mm -hmm. fool with them Christians. That mm -hmm. they, mm -hmm. That's why I don't go to, that's why I don't go to church, which is really no excuse, excuse right. because when we stand before God one right. day, Absolutely. we stand before him alone. Yeah. And so we are not here. He's not going to ask you about Jerry Falwell Jr. or nobody else. He's right. going to ask you about you. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, you know. I just look at it like God, he says in his word mm -hmm. that I'm shaking everything that can be shaken. Yes. So that that which cannot be shaken shall remain. Yes. And so God's church is going to remain. Mm -hmm. And God don't mind shaking bad apples off the tree. Yep. And he forewarns us. Yep. Before he exposes us. Absolutely. He gives us a chance to get it together. Absolutely. So, uh, let's Absolutely. pray for the church. Yes. Because the church is being persecuted in a lot of different ways. I mean, we're not like we can't serve God kind of persecution. Right. Mm -hmm. It's like the church is no good. Yeah. That's kind of, that's kind of person. Mm -hmm. You know, that kind of, we Christians aren't being killed in this nation. Don't get it twisted. Mm -hmm. But it's it's like the church is no good. Mm -hmm. And that's not true. Yeah. Okay, so let's go before the throne of God and let's bow our heads yes. and let's ask God to yes. help us. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning and we thank you for your goodness and your mercy yes. toward us. We yes, thank Lord. you for this beautiful day. Yes, Lord. I pray for the people in Louisiana, dear God. Yes. I pray that they will be helped. I pray that you will, just like you helped us through Ike and, yes, and through Harvey. And through yes. Harvey, Father, I know that they uh, 
you're just going through right now, dear Father. Yes. I pray, God, for the people that have lost their homes. Yes. I pray that I pray they have they have insurance. If not, I pray that our federal government will help them. I pray that FEMA will help them. I pray that yes. their neighbors and family members will help them, dear God. Yes. That was a terrible storm, God. It just seemed mm. like your hand is against America right now, mm. God. And we ask you for forgiveness of yes. America's sins, for they are many. Yes. They are many, 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 many. Yes. And we ask you, God, we humble ourselves. Our country needs to humble itself before you, dear God. Yes. Then we want to go on like it's, these are normal times. We want to go on like this pandemic is enraging. Yes. But you're showing us, dear God, every time they try to start something up, it, this disease spreads more and yes. more and more. God, yes. when is man going to learn to be still and know that you are God? Yes, Lord. Yes. When will man learn that they need to stop putting money over you, yes. over what you're doing here in this country. Yes. Father, I pray for our leadership. Yes, I Lord. pray for leadership in this country. Yes. I pray for godly wisdom. Yes. I pray that you will keep us. Yes. Keep us, Father. Yes, Lord. In the name of Jesus. Yes, Lord. Go into every hospital room, Father, and touch. Yes. Heal. Yes. Lord. Revive. I pray for my sister as she has to go. Yes. And to surgery on tomorrow and have a bypass, Father. Yes. I know that you will be with her and I thank you in advance. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Praise God. Thank, thank you. you thank you, Lord. Pastor Cheryl. Amen. And and take that phone. Put, put that in there. So, so thank you, Pastor Cheryl, for uh the exhortation and uh the prayers on this morning. Truly our nation needs prayer. And um you know, we certainly want to continue to pray for the people over in Louisiana, particularly in Lake Charles. You know, my uh, sister, uh, Loretta, uh, is in Lake Charles. Thank God that uh, she didn't sustain a whole lot of damage uh, at her home. And um, thank God that she were able to make it back here only yesterday. And uh, we get a chance to see her in a little bit. And uh, but I'm I'm so grateful that uh, things were not as bad as they could have been. Oh yeah. And that mm -hmm. things are as good as they are. So we we're gonna continue to keep uh, the people in Lake Charles and Louisiana uh, in our prayers and um, pray that God continues to bless. Amen. So I mean Habakkuk chapter number two. Habakkuk chapter number two. This is the foundational passage of scriptures that we read uh, during this year. Um, as I've been saying all year long, um, when God gave me this passage of scripture and this assignment to study and preach on the book of Habakkuk, the second chapter, uh, I didn't know that it was going to go in the direction that it has gone in. Nevertheless, uh, I'm grateful to God for the assignment because it's powerful and it says a lot uh, and it, it, it has revealed so much to us in this year. And so as Habakkuk uh, is writing this, he's writing it from the standpoint where the nation of Judah is about to go into exile and he could not understand why God was going to use a heathen king and a heathen nation to punish his own people. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, uh, he, he understood that the people had had neglected yeah. obeying God. Yeah. Bishop, whenever God wants to punish a nation, he will rise up an e evil leader mm -hmm. over that nation. Absolutely. Absolutely. Y'all remember that. Always remember that. <laughs> when he wants to punish a nation, punish a people, uh, particularly his own people. Mm -hmm. He used an evil nation. Mm -hmm. Now, so... An evil leader. Yeah, evil, evil leader. Now, also, also Habakkuk's contemporary, Jeremiah, uh, prophesied the same thing. And he prophesied them going in. And while they were in, he prophesied how long they would be in. And told the people, you might as well settle yourself down. Mm -hmm because we're going to be in this situation for a while. Wow. 70 years. This is not a quick solution. This 
is going to be a long-term thing. We're going to be here for 70 years. Now, other prophets wanted to prophesy that it was going to be quick. It's going to be over within two years. Jeremiah, what God told Jeremiah, that straighten that situation out. Mm -hmm. Help him to understand, no, this is going to be a while. Have your children to marry. Um, build homes. Have children. And that lying prophet that told him that yeah, God killed him God too. God killed him. God killed him. Yeah. So, you know, when God prophesies something and when God is dealing with you in a certain way, uh, there's no way of getting out of this unless, you know, you repent. And get it right. Get it right. But see, God had, God had been telling them for over 400 years to do what they needed to do, to obey his command, and they weren't listening. Mm -hmm. So in the back of two, starting at verse one, he says, I will stand my watch and set myself on the rampart and watch to see what he will say to me and what I will answer when I am corrected. Then the Lord answered me and said, write the vision and make it plain on tablets that he may run who reads it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it will speak and it will not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it because it will surely come. It will not tarry. Behold the proud. Now God is speaking about the enemy, the evil king, the leader that is going to... Uh, Judge Judah and the nation um, is talking about how he's proud. Mm -hmm. Going to judge God's own people. King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. He said, behold the proud. His soul is not upright in him. Ooh, Jesus. But the just mm -hmm. shall live by his faith. Now, I want you all to go over to chapter 2 of the Revelation because... You know, this is going to be good. This King Nebuchadnezzar was a proud and arrogant leader. Proud and arrogant king. And, um, you know, he wanted the Hebrew boys, once they were, you know, um, in Babylon, uh, he wanted not only the Hebrew boys, but all of the people. Uh, talking about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and all the people from mm -hmm. Judah to bow down bow to down. his image mm -hmm. and worship him. Mm. But they wouldn't do it. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. This today's message is going to be very relevant, and I hope y'all stay with me on this because it's going to be re very relevant to the times that we're living in. And <clears throat> I'm going to start reading. Well, let me give us a little review from last week, and then I'm going to read um, verses eight through eleven. Because in our study on last week, we did part two of. The church at Ephesus. Now, this series is entitled The Seven Churches of Asia Minor. And this is part five of it. Last week we did part two of the church of Ephesus. And we saw how after Jesus had given them their commendation, he began his admo admonition and his accounting of them. Uh, even though the church had been a church that labored for the Lord and they were patient. And they persevered through persecution for his namesake. They did not tolerate evil and they did not faint. They had tested who called, tested those who had called themselves apostles and proved them that they were liars. Uh, Jesus rebuked them because they left their first love. The initial love that they had for him when they first got saved. And he warned them to remember from which they had fallen and to repent and to do the first works or he would remove their candlestick, which was the church. And if they didn't repent, that's what he was going to do. And so we saw how they didn't repent. And history tells us that because they didn't repent, Islam took over that city, the nation, the, the, um, Religion of Islam took over that city. And then Jesus stated that he who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit has to say to the churches. And to him who overcomes, he would give them the right to eat from the tree of life in the paradise of God. Now today, we're going to look at the church at Smyrna, which is the persecuted church. 
Smyrna, the persecuted church. Look at verses 11, or uh, 8 through 11, I'm sorry. Verses 8 through 11, Revelation chapter number 2. And as Jesus talking once again, he says, and to the church, and to the angel of the, of the church in Smyrna, write these things saying, the first and the last who was dead and came to life. I know your works, tribulation, and poverty, but you are rich, and I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw you or to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested and you will have tribulation 10 days. Be faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. Now look, it's only four verses here. And, but these four verses are very powerful and there's a lot of unpacking that we have to do in these four verses because there's a lot of historical background that we want to cover today. And so we're not going to do all four of the verses. We're going to get to about just two of them, eight and nine, because that, there's a lot of information in this. The church at Smyrna, which is the persecuted church. So, first of all, we remember now the the Jesus is addressing the angel of the church. And remember, the word angel means messenger. And so he's talking to the pastor of the church. He addresses the pastor of the church. He speaks to the pastor of the church at Smyrna, and all of the seven churches of Asia Minor. Now, let me start out by saying this. The letter to the church at Smyrna was the shortest one of the seven. And yet, it's filled with praise. Mm -hmm. There is no condemnation from Jesus for this church. The church at Philadelphia was the only other church that escaped the Lord's rebuke. And so let's see why the Lord was pleased with Smyrna. Uh, let's deal with some things here because first thing that we want to see is the assembly or the audience here in Smyrna. Uh, the city of Smyrna was important for her trade and she was located on a deep gulf about 35 miles north of Ephesus. Uh, it had a great harbor that could be totally enclosed in a time of war. And Alexander the Great rebuilt the city and determined to make it a model Greek city. It was a city of wealth and commercial greatness and was referred to as the beautiful. <laughs> uh, it's received its name from one of the principal commercial products, myrrh. It also had a profitable population of over 300,000, with two-thirds of the people being professing Christians, two-thirds of the population of Smyrna. Now, remember, you have uh, 300,000, so 200,000 of them were professing Christians in that city. Now, the Greek word for Smyrna means suffering, and it comes from the word myrrh. Myrrh was a fragrant uh, aromatic sap taken from a shrubbery tree, shrubbery tree uh, and it had a bitter taste. Uh, this gum could be extracted by cutting an incision into the bark of its trunk and its branches. And the oily sap would then ooze out of the tree, drop onto the wooden squares or stones and solidify. The process involved the disfigurement of the tree. And myrrh was a perfect symbol of, the, of them then of suffering and the blessings that can come from suffering. And I know some people say, man, how in the world can blessings come out of suffering? No, yeah. I ain't trying to suffer. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> trying to hear that. Yeah. 
And uh, this is what happened to the believers in the city uh, of Smyrna. Myrrh was used for several purposes. Uh, it was used in perfumes. It was an ingredient of the holy anointing oil of the priest. Uh, it was for the purification of women and embalming. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wise men brought this spice to Jesus yes. at his birth, yes. if you remember. Yes. Uh -huh. Thus, myrrh is associated with Christ in his first coming. The wise men gave the Lord, first of all, gold, which is a picture of his royalty. Secondly, they gave him frankincense, which is a picture of his deity and purity. And thirdly, they gave him myrrh, which is a picture of his suffering humanity. And when Christ was on the cross, he was offered a mingle, a, a wine rather mingled with myrrh, which would act as a painkiller. And when Christ comes again, he will be presented with gold and frankincense again, but not myrrh. Uh -huh. This time he's not coming to suffer. This time he's coming to reign triumphantly. In Isaiah chapter 60 and verse number 60 says, The multitude of camels shall cover your land, the drum dairies of Midian and the ephod. Uh, all, those who, uh, all those from Sheba shall come. They shall bring gold and incense, and they shall proclaim the praises of the Lord. So in order for this spice to give to give out its full fragrance and perfume, it had to be crushed and it had to be beaten. And this is exactly what was done to the church in Smyrna. And it was crushed, beaten, and persecuted. It was in the midst of bitter sorrow and suffering. It was the most afflicted and persecuted of all the churches. And it is suffering. In its suffering, brother, it gave off the fragrance of Christ, suffering, suffering. Smyrna was an outstandingly beautiful city and claimed to be the glory of Asia. Uh, spacious streets ran throughout the city. The most famous street was called the Golden Street. And it began with the Temple of Zeus and ended with the Temple of Cybele. Uh, the goddess of nature. Uh, all the temples were located on this street. And on every side, the splendors of pagan worship appeared. The city also possessed a famous stadium and library. And Smyrna was noted also to be the birthplace of the poet Homer. Now remember, 300,000 citizens in this city. Two-thirds of them were Christian. That's about 200,000 believers in this city. 100,000 of these people were unbelievers. They were pagans. They were, they were sinners. You got all this paganism and idolatry that was going on, but you have 200,000 Christians in that city. Smyrna was first in beauty, but also considered first in Caesar worship. 100,000 non-believers, 200,000 believers. believers. Mm-hmm. Now, Smyrna was, con it, it considered itself to be the number one city in Caesar worship, the Roman emperor. Mm-hmm. It was very, very local to Rome and always sided with Rome in a, in any civil war. And in fact, in 196 BC, Smyrna had erected a temple to Dia Roma, the goddess of Rome. And they actually worshiped the city of Rome. A century later, General Salu, uh, Sula's rather, Sula's ill-clad army faced bitter winter weather. And when the dilemma of these Roman soldiers was announced in a general assembly of Smyrna citizens, they reportedly took took their own clothes and sent, sent to these uh, soldiers for their loyalty to Rome, to the city of Rome, the citizens' loyalty to the city of Rome. Smyrna was rewarded by Rome by being a free city and a judicial center which gave it great prominence. 
the city prospered in the areas of commerce and science and medicine. Now, the emperor, listen to this, listen to this. Got to get this piece now. The emperor became the embodiment of Rome and worship began to be directed toward him. Oh, God. Mm. Yes. Emperor worship was started to unite the Roman Empire and as a demonstration of gratitude to Rome for the peace and civility it brought to the world. But toward the end of the first century, the emperor, Domitian, it went from voluntary worship to mandatory worship. Mm -hmm. Did you hear what I said? Mm -hmm. It went from voluntary worship mm -hmm. to mandatory worship. And once a year, a Roman citizen, all the Roman citizens had to burn a pinch of incense on the altar of Caesar. All they had to do was say, Caesar is Lord. And, and, and then they could depart to worship any God that they wished to worship. And refusal to do this was an indication to Rome that the person, the person was disloyal to Rome and an outlaw or a rebel. Ooh, Jesus. Smyrna was a place of heroes. Uh -huh. For many of the Christians refused to acknowledge Caesar as Lord. Did you hear what I said? Mm -hmm. Many of the Christians, ref I didn't say all, oh. many yes. of the Christians, now remember when I started reading this, I told you that two-thirds of the citizens, which is about 200,000, the citizenship was 300,000, and two-thirds of them, 200,000, they proclaimed to be Christians. Mm -hmm. Come on, somebody. Yeah. Uh-huh. And many, many of the Christians refused to acknowledge that Caesar was Lord. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> that meant that some of the Christians... Yeah. Yeah. They compromised oh, Jesus. Yes. and they acknowledged because they did not want to appear disloyal to the emperor. Come on here, somebody. Yeah. How many of you all know that the only person that we are supposed to be loyal to is Jesus the Christ? Yes. The only person that we are to declare is Lord mm -hmm. is Jesus. Yes, yes. There is no other Lord. He is the Lord of Lords. Now, no, the Bible says, Romans 10 and verse 9, that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord mm -hmm. and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Yeah. There is no other Lord. Mm -hmm. No other master, no other ruler, no other owner of your life other than Jesus Christ. Jesus is Lord, not Caesar. No emperor, no president, no governor, no mayor, no man is your Lord. We cannot compromise our faith. There's only one Lord. Amen. And his name is is Jesus. I told you this this is going to be relevant today because what we see in this is what we are seeing what's going on in America today. Mm -hmm. You have to be loyal to this leader. Yes. Because if you're not loyal, you're going to be persecuted. Mm -hmm. Somebody need to listen to Amen. this today. Somebody need to listen. Look, let's let's get into the author or the architect of the letter. Um, in verse number eight, and the Lord and to the angel brother of the church of Smyrna, these things says the first and the last who was dead and came to life. In the Bible, in the Bible days, the author of the letter identifies himself at the beginning of the letter, not at the end. The Lord identifies himself as the first and the last, mm -hmm. as the one which was dead and is alive. 
the first and the last are terms God for God, rather, in the Old Testament. Listen to what Isaiah chapter 44 and verse number 6 says. It says, Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. I am the first and the last. Besides me, there is no God. Jesus refers to himself as, as the first and the last. He refers to himself as God. Yes. Listen to Isaiah 48 and 12. Listen to me, O Jacob and Israel, my call. I am he. I am the first and also the last. I am the first. I am also the last. So Jesus refers to himself as the first and the last. This is who God in the Old Testament refers to himself as well. Now let's keep going here because the term, the term dead and alive are in the, and the uh, aristocracy tense, uh, indicating a completed act in the past. This verse can be rendered, which was dead and came to life again, referring to his resurrection. Our Lord consoles them by reminding them that he had passed through the suffering and death and triumphed over it. Now let's look at the affliction and the adversity of the church at Smyrna. Look at verses 9 and 10. Jesus writes, he says, I know your works, tribulation, poverty, but you are rich. That's, that's an oxymoron. He says, you, you're poverty, but you're rich. And then he says, and I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested. And you will have tribulation 10 days. Be faithful unto death. And I will give you the crown of life. Be faithful. Mm -hmm. You're going to suffer. Mm -hmm. But be faithful unto death. Mm -hmm. And I will give you the crown of life. Now, remember, these are commendations that Jesus gives to the church. He has no condemnation. Mm -hmm. These are condemn They were a faithful church. Mm -hmm. They suffered for the Lord. Yes. They did not compromise. Mm -hmm. And he said, if you be faithful unto death, I'm going to give you a crown of life. If you suffer with me, yes. you will reign yes. with me. Oh, you know, now, what I'm about to share with us now is, is very interesting because we're going to look at some of the suffering that the church went through in Smyrna. Mm -hmm. um, Christians today, particularly Christians here in America, in, in this time, this season that we're in mm -hmm. with this COVID virus, you can't go to church and assemble, you know, and yeah. worship like you want to. Yeah. Um, you you have to wear masks. Mm -hmm. it, it's mandatory. You think that's suffering. That's not suffering. Amen. As a matter of fact, you don't even know what suffering is. Yes, yes. You don't really know what persecution is. Listen to what these, these believers in Smyrna had to go through. God said that they would have tribulation for 10 days, indicating that they were going to undergo intense suffering. But it would be brief. Some Bible scholars believe as they look back on history now, that this could have been a reference to 10 separate attempts to wipe out Christianity by 10 different Roman emperors. Uh, here is what happened under these emperors. The 10 days may not refer to these events, but it does give us an idea of what believers went through in that time. Uh, may we thank God for the freedom that we have here as believers, glory to God. And, you know, to spread the gospel in America because 
what we are dealing with is nothing in comparison to what these believers went through. Mm -hmm. Now, number one, Nero. Nero, he reigned from 64 AD to 68 AD. Christians were blamed for burning Rome, the burning of Rome, which was not at all true. So they were lied upon. Mm -hmm. They didn't burn Rome. Yeah. Glory to God. He crucified Christians and fed them to wild beasts. He also had Paul executed, and possibly Peter. If you know anything about Peter, when he was executed, he was hung on a cross, but he was hung upside down because he didn't feel like he was worthy to be hung on the cross in the same way that his Lord, Jesus Christ, was hung. Mm -hmm. They were blamed for stuff that they did not do. Mm -hmm. I think African Americans know something about that. Mm -hmm. My history here in America, uh, lies that were told on us for things that we did not do and we suffered for it, lynched. Hmm. Number two, Domitian, he reigned from 90 to, 80 to, 90 to 8, 96 AD and thousands of uh, Christians were killed by him in Rome. He was responsible for banishing John to the island of Patmos. Then Trajan, he reigned from 104 to 117 AD. And Christianity was outlawed by his edicts. He was responsible for burning Ignatius at the stake. I've seen in history books how African Americans were hung on trees and burned. Number four, Marcus Aurelius, 161 to 180 AD. Christians were tortured and beheaded by this man. Number five, Severus, 200 to 211 AD. He crucified and burned and beheaded believers. You think because you can't go to church and assemble, you being persecuted. You don't know what persecution Amen. is. Amen. Then number six, that was Maximinus from 235 to 237 AD. Christians were put to death by him. Um, number seven, Decius from 250 to 253 AD. He executed every Christian he could find and endeavored to ob obliterate Christianity. He wanted to wipe Christianity out. You talk about your rights being taken from you. You have the freedom of speech. You can preach the gospel with freedom. You don't have to be in the house of the Lord to preach. You can preach it just like we're preaching right now over the internet. Mm -hmm. You can go out on the streets and preach and have freedom to preach the gospel. You can wear t-shirts that say, I'm a Christian. Mm -hmm. You can carry your Bible wherever you want to go. In some places in the world, they have to have church underground. They have to hide from the government because Christians are persecuted and Christians are being beheaded if it's found out that they are believers. You're not being persecuted in America. You don't know what persecution is. So stop saying it. You really, really should stop saying it. Yeah. And then... Um, Number eight, Valerian from 257 to 260 AD. His goal was to wipe out Christianity. He put the Bishop of Carthage to death. And then number nine, Aurelian from 270 to 275 AD. He persecuted believers any way he could. <clears throat> and then there's Diocletian from 300 to 312 AD. He was responsible for burning the scriptures. He burned the, the scriptures up. <coughs> they didn't even have scriptural references. He was responsible for burning up. And other believers, others believe rather that the 10 days could have been referenced to the persecution under Diocletian, which lasted exactly 10 years. Each day represented a year. And the main thought seemed to, to indicate a time of intense testing. 
The number 10 in the Bible is the number of divine testing or divine completion. Christians in America, you know, you haven't been persecuted. You don't really know what persecution is until you have gone through what these believers went through in the early years of Christianity, the first century, uh, the first two, three centuries. Of, you don't really know what persecution is. Lord, have mercy. Uh, when I think about persecution, as I mentioned earlier about what Africans, our ancestors had to go through in slavery when they came here, being lynched, being burned, being raped, men and women being raped, children being separated and sold to other plantations. And don't tell me, don't tell me that there were some godly uh, plantation owners who treated their slaves good. Come on here. Man, being a slave is one of the worst things that you could have ever imagined being. Mm -hmm. There were no good masters. Mm -hmm. They didn't treat their people with humanity and dignity. There's no such thing. Mm -hmm. You were treated as property. Mm -hmm. You were lower than humans. That's what they thought, they, tr the way they treated you. That's the way they mm -hmm. they taught you that you were. You were lower than animals. Mm -hmm. A dog can go and travel where he wanted to. Absolutely. Dogs could go and travel <laughs> freely anywhere. But a slave, you better not be caught off the plantation. Mm -hmm. So don't tell me about there were some slaves that were well treated. You wouldn't have lasted as a slave. You, you couldn't even last trying to work your own land. Mm -hmm. That's why you went... But let me stop. Let me stop because I'm running out of time. The church at Smyrna suffered from three sources of pain. Jesus says, I know your tribulation. The Greek word for tribulation, thalipsis, which means pressure, oppression, stress, anguish, adversity, affliction, crushing, squashing, squeezing, distress. This word was used of a man who was tortured to death by being slowly crushed under a big boulder laid upon him. It was to, de it, it was to describe the crushing of wheat under the millstone. The Smyrna church was under great stress and pressure being crushed by the Romans. Jesus told them he knew <clears throat> what they were going through. In the, the pictures of the ancient Roman method of threshing grain, one man was always seen stirring up the sheaves while another man rides over them in a crude cart equipped with rollers instead of wheels. <clears throat> Sharp stones and rough bits of iron were attached to these cylinders to help separate the husks from the grain. The, this simple cart was called a tribulum, which from which we get our word tribulation. When great affliction comes to us, we often think of ourselves as being torn to pieces under the cruel pressure of adverse circumstances and realize that the purpose of threshing is to expose the grain and the purpose of our trials is to bring out the best inside, not to destroy us. And then he says, I know your poverty. I know your poverty. Mm. There are two Greek words for poverty. And one of the words is penia, which describes the poverty of the man who has to work for a living. He has to work to make ends meet. He has to work to scrape to get by. He has to work for a living. That would describe most people. Uh, the word for poverty here in this text is polchia, pol which means destitution. Uh, the implication is that a person has nothing at all. These folks were so poor that even the poor folks thought they were poor. Because of their stand for Christ, they lost their jobs, they lost their businesses, and social status, and were considered outlaws. Lord have mercy, Jesus. Many of these folks 
had their homes plundered by vandals and thieves or Romans, and no one lifted a finger to help them because of the stigma that was placed upon them. People felt they deserved this because of the, uh, they deserved this treatment. People hated Christians in Smyrna for several reasons. Number one, Christians were considered disloyal atheists because they would not worship the Greeks or the Roman gods. Number two, Christians were considered atheists because they would not uh, worship Caesar. Number three, Christians were accused of being cannibals because of misunderstanding about the Lord's Supper. Number four, they were accused of being immoral because of the greeting of a holy kiss. Number five, Christians were accused of being homebreakers because of the division that was caused when one spouse was saved and the other was still lost in sin. And then he says, I know the blasphemy. I know the blasphemy. The Greek word for blasphemy is blasphemia, which means slander. <clears throat> The Jewish unbelievers hated Christians and sought to destroy their reputation. They had great influence among the Romans, especially Roman women who admired the morals of the Jewish men. The Roman women could be influenced to speak to their husbands who were in leadership to afflict the Christians. The Jewish unbelievers were lost and being used of Satan to kill Christians. And for this reason, they are called the synagogue of Satan. Listen to what Jesus said in John chapter 8 and verse number 44. He says, you of your father, the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murder, murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they were the synagogue of Satan. Let me, let me say something. He said that they claimed that they were Jews, mm -hmm. but they were not Jews. Mm -hmm. They claimed to be, but they were not Jews. They were of the synagogue of Satan. I, I want to say this. If, if a person is authentically Hebrew or Jew, mm -hmm. Jewish religion, mm -hmm. if they really are, mm -hmm. DNA does not lie. Yes. Uh, I know we got some folk here in America who say that they are uh, the true Israel, Hebrew, Israelites. That's it. Hebrew, yeah. Israelite. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. if, if you are, you are. And, and DNA will not we'll lie. Yes. It, it will prove that you are truly a Hebrew. Yes. I would suggest you get some DNA tests to find out which tribe you're from. Mm -hmm. That would be wonderful, wouldn't it? Mm. Yes. Yeah. And, and then you have people who are in Israel who claim that they are Jews. Mm -hmm. And we found, we've discovered that over the years that now they're doing DNA tests mm -hmm. to see who are truly Israelis, who are truly Jews. Mm -hmm. And uh, DNA doesn't lie. And come to find out that a lot of people who claim to be Jews are actually Khazars. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They're from Europe. They're we'll not the Jews. Yeah. Yes. Well, Caucasus. Caucasus Mountain is where we get the word Caucasian. Mm -hmm. There are some Jews in Israel who are from Ethiopia, and they're the only ones. They're the only ones who are truly, authentically, who can truly prove by their DNA that they are truly, authentically Jews. Mm -hmm. I'm going to leave that there. Because Jesus said, you know, these people say that they're Jews. Mm -hmm. but, and Jesus would know. Yes. They say they're Jews, but they are not. He says, but they are a synagogue, synagogue of Satan. Of Satan. As I was reading this and doing some research, 
I found out that the vast majority of the people who claim to be Jews in Israel are non-religious Jews. Mm. They don't even practice their religion. Mm. All right, let me close with this because <coughs> today the church of Smyrna is behind the green curtain of Islam's nation, the, of the Islamic nations. Uh, the bamboo and the red curtains of China and other communist countries and the iron curtain of dictatorship nations. If America is not careful, we're headed down the same road. Mm -hmm. We're supposed to be a democracy. And it appears that if we're not loyal to this <coughs> present administration, you will suffer for it. Yeah. Let me let me share this with you as I close because I was you know doing my research the other day and I ran across this this interview with this evangelical minister um, who shared with uh, the interviewer what evangelicals say privately about Donald Trump. And you can find it on YouTube. You can see it for yourself. You don't have to believe me. You know, they know that he is immoral. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they know that he's not even a believer. They know that, you know, he is off the chain or on the edge, what they call it. They, they know he's not what they have tried to make people believe he is. They know it. Mm -hmm. All they want from him is for him to give them what they want. Mm -hmm. And they will support him at all costs. And they are also afraid that if they speak against him, mm -hmm. if they prove to be disloyal to him, mm -hmm. that he will destroy them. They are more afraid of him mm -hmm. than they are of God. Of God. Oh, Jesus, help us today, Father. So I'm going to close with that. Because, see, the Bible teaches us that we're to fear no man, that we're to fear God only. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And we are to fear him, and we're not to fear any man. I want to say this to you. If you're watching me and you're unsure of your eternal destiny, if you cannot honestly say, Bishop Hines, I know I'm saved. I know when I die, I know I'm going to heaven to be with the Lord. If you can't say that for sure, then I want to give you an opportunity to be saved. The Bible says, for all have sinned, fall short of the glory of God, and there's none righteous, no, not one. Romans 6 and 23 says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10 say that if you would confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and verse 9 say, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, and not by works, lest any man should boast. We're not saved because we're good people. We're not saved because we get it right all the time. We're not saved for any of those reasons. But we're saved because God loved us, sent Jesus to die for the sins of the whole world. And on the third day, he raised him from the dead, and he has seated him at his own right hand. And if you're watching me and you're unsure of your eternal destiny, you know that you're not saved, but you want to be saved, then I want to lead you in a word of prayer. I'm going to ask if you would, please bow your heads and just repeat this prayer after me and God will save you from your sins. Just repeat this prayer. Dear God in heaven, I acknowledge that I'm a sinner. I repent of my sins and I turn away from them and I turn my life to you. I believe that Jesus is your son, that he died for all of my sins, and you raised him from the dead. Lord Jesus, I ask that you 
would come into my life and save me, guide me, lead me, and teach me to live this saved life. Right now, I receive you by faith as my Savior and my Lord. And I thank you, Jesus, for saving me. I give my life to you. Now fill me with the Holy Ghost. Fill me with the overflowing measures. Give me the ability to speak in other tongues and the power to bear witness of you. By faith, I receive the Holy Ghost. By faith, I'm filled with the Holy Ghost. By faith, I have the tongues and I have the power. Thank you for filling me today. In Jesus' name, amen. Glory to God. If you said that prayer and you meant it with all of your heart, I want you to know God saved you from your sins. He filled you with his spirit and he's given you a brand new life in him, his very own life, eternal life. The next thing that you should do if you're not already a member of a good Bible teaching church, I encourage you to find a good Bible teaching church Unite with that church and become a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then out of your obedience to him, be baptized. And after the pandemic is over and you live in 770-89-034-075, even 775-81 zip codes, after the pandemic is over, come and unite with New Covenant. We, you're close to us. We'd love to have you as a member of our church family. Amen. Amen. And I want to just take a moment, Pastor Cheryl, and thank all of the people who tune in to our live stream every Sunday. Yes. You know, we have a lot of different people that tune in. People who are not even members of our church, they tune in to us and support us. And, and I thank God for each and every one of you all yes. that do that. We truly do appreciate um, your support, your tuning in to the live stream. And uh, and I'm grateful. And I want to say this too, as, as I get ready to shut it down, you know, uh, as I was praying, I, I thought about something else that's on that video, how the evangelical minister talked about, um, you know, what evangelicals say about um, uh, the president. And they use, they use a lot of fear tactics. Fear mongering is what they call it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I just, I want to encourage you as Christians Believers, get registered to vote. And when it's election time, get into early voting. Go to the polls and vote. Make your vote count. Yeah. I, I'm not trying to be political here. It's just, it's just time out for all of this foolishness that's going on in our nation. And it's time to make a change. Mm -hmm. We are the people who can do it. <laughs> So if you want to give your tithe and your offering, I encourage you to go to our website, New Covenant Christian Church Houston dot com and uh, just download or just go on to our website there and just go to where it says uh, give or donate, give the fly or donate. Or you can download our church app if you don't already have it. If you have an iPad, iPhone, Android or Motorola phone. Just go to your app store and download our free app and see where it says donate or give a fly. And you can set up your giving and you can start giving your tithe and your offering. If you're a member of another church, always give your tithe and your offering to your church. And if you want to sow a seed into New Covenant, if, if what we're doing is blessing you, then you want to sow a seed, then sow a seed. We want you to know we appreciate every one of you that do that. Amen? Amen. Pastor Cheryl, you have anything else you want to share? Well, I, I would like for you all on tomorrow um, about 7.30 in the morning, my sister is going into surgery. She mm -hmm. has to have a bypass. Mm -hmm. My sister Carolyn, so, you know, most of you all in New Covenant know the trials and tribulations that she's gone through. Yeah. But God has always delivered her. So we ask that you pray for her tomorrow morning. Yes. Remember her in your prayers. Yes. Uh, ask God to... Let the surgery be successful. Yes. Got the hands of the anesthesiologist and the surgeon and yes. everybody that's in the room. Amen. Amen. So thank y'all very, very much. Amen. Glory to God. All right. Well, Brother Chris will be at the church at 12. 
And uh, if, from 12 to 1, if you want to drop by and drop your offering off at the church, and uh, or you can drop it off at the daycare sometime this week or at the church sometime this week. Amen? Amen. And uh, thank you all so much for tuning in today. We will see you all, if the Lord says the same, on Wednesday evening at 7. And God bless you we'll all. We'll see you all at Sunday school. Yeah, yeah, Sunday school at 1030. Amen. <laughs> thank you, Pastor. Okay, that's Sunday school at 1030. That's good. Y'all need to uh, come on into Sunday school. Yeah, yeah, tune on in. Sister Deidre, if you don't mind, put, put the... Um, the ID up there for the people to tune in uh, to the Sunday school class, the um, the uh, total money makeover is going to bless you. All right. Thank you, executive producer BJ, for working with us on the day. You can close us out. God bless you all. We love you all. Love you all.